tarde a todos. Eu tenho hoje o privilégio de me dirigir a vós antes de dois distintos convidados que iremos ter aqui no palco. Refiro-me naturalmente à nossa oradora convidada, a professora Rita Sharon, do programa em Narrative Medicine da Universidade de Columbia, e ao moderador desta palestra, o professor Jorge Soares, diretor do programa Gulbenkian Inovar em Saúde. A ambos começo por agradecer a disponibilidade e a presença que muito nos honra. Antes de lhes passar a palavra, em nome do projeto que tenho o privilégio de liderar, Narrativa em Medicina, Contextos e Práticas Interdisciplinares, gostaria de agradecer, em primeiro lugar, à presidência da Fundação Chapalimô, na pessoa da Sra. Dra. Leonor Beleza, a cedência destas magníficas instalações. Também à professora Teresa Cid, diretora do Centro de Estudos Anglísticos da Universidade de Lisboa, que acolhe o projeto, deixo uma palavra de muito sincero reconhecimento pela sua intermediação nos contactos com esta Fundação. E porque posso não ter oportunidade de o fazer após a conclusão da palestra, o meu reconhecido obrigado ao professor António Barbosa, diretor do Centro de Bioética da Faculdade de Medicina da Universidade de Lisboa, que aceitou a tarefa de apresentar um dos resultados mais visíveis do nosso trabalho de investigação, o volume de ensaios Creative Dialogues, Narrative and Medicine, o qual é dedicado à consultora professora Rita Sharon. Acrescento apenas para benefício daqueles de entre os presentes que possam não ter acompanhado as muitas atividades que temos vindo a desenvolver, que o nosso é um projeto de investigação de âmbito internacional e interdisciplinar, que além da pesquisa propriamente dita, apresenta uma vertente de formação muito vincada. Lançámos a primeira unidade curricular de pós-graduação em Medicina Narrativa no país, no ano letivo de 2012, 2013, em parceria com a Faculdade de Medicina da Universidade de Lisboa e com a Escola Superior de Enfermagem de Lisboa e a partir do presente ano também com a Faculdade de Ciências Médicas da Universidade Nova de Lisboa. Ao mesmo tempo, temos vindo a apostar crescentemente em intervenções no terreno, quer em âmbito hospitalar, quer em associações de doentes e afins. Se viermos a conseguir novo financiamento, o que nunca se sabe, é nossa intenção intensificar este último tipo de ações que consideramos da maior importância. Termino saudando a Assembleia aqui reunida, aqueles a quem enviámos convites e todos os outros que vieram correspondendo ao apelo das nossas ações de divulgação que procurámos que fossem tão abrangentes quanto possível. A todos quero agradecer pelo interesse demonstrado e pela presença. I will now switch into English, if you don't mind, for the benefit of our guest speaker, Professor Rita Sharon, to whom I would like to publicly thank for her steadfast support as consultant and as a friend to our project. I met Professor Sharon in 2008 in Toronto, and then in September 2010, she was one of the plenary speakers in the project's inaugural conference here in Lisbon. In 2011, she came over to lecture once more in Lisbon. Last March, unfortunately, <clears throat> she was unable to uh, participate as guest speaker in our conference held at the Gulbenkian Foundation, Caring for the Future, Narrative and Medicine, as was originally intended. But she agreed to come now, and I'm very grateful for her generous availability. Since 2008 and throughout all these past seven years, Professor Sharon's work and her example have been an inspiration to us all. Some members of our research team were in Colombia and had the chance of attending seminars and other activities related to the program in narrative medicine, of meeting Professor Sharon and of benefiting from her advice. We feel privileged indeed for all this invaluable help. Dedicating our book to you, Rita, is but a simple gesture of heartfelt gratitude, and it is more than justified in view of all you've done for us. Thank you so much. I now 
we'll leave the floor to you and to Professor Jorge Soares, for I'm sure everybody here in this amphitheater is very much looking forward to listening to what Professor Sharon has to tell, uh, has to tell us today. But before, two practical announcements. Um, those of you who need certificates of, attention, of attendance may get them at the entrance. Just speak to Ileana at the table outside. And would you please uh, switch off your mobile phones before we start? Thank you so much. Welcome. Muito boa tarde, como se diz agora a todas e a todos. É um grande gosto de estar aqui e queria agradecer à professora Isabel Fernandes este privilégio. I'd like to thank the organizers of this meeting, especially Professor Isabel Fernandes, for giving me the honor to introduce Professor Rita Sharon to this audience of today. All of us that teach medical students as well nursing and other healthcare professionals recognize that the technology-driven environment of today's teaching settings do not promote and even overshadows the transmission of human values, the deeply rooted principles of our practice, the inspiring role of our best models which, since the antiquity, are identified with so-called art, the medicine, art of medicine, and the embedding humanity of the patient's care. The need to search for a new paradigm in the training of health professionals is being felt as needed. Based on her experience as internist, and later on as professor of clinical medicine and being inspired for an interest in the endless cross-talk between medicine and literature, Dr. Sharon had the vision that narrative medicine could fulfill that gap. The gap I mentioned in the training programs of our future medical doctors, nurses, and health or other health professionals. At that time, 1999, Dr. Sharon completed a PhD in English from Columbia University with a thesis about the writings, novels, and tales of Henry James, and I think a new book is coming out soon, exploring how storytelling could contribute to embody human values in the daily practice of medicine. The term narrative medicine was coined in 2000, and I quote, to refer to clinical practice fortified by narrative competence, capacity to recognize, to absorb, to metabolize, to interpret, and be moved by the stories of illness. Since then, 2000, year 2000, the scholar program in narrative in medicine was launched at Columbia University, prestigious academic institution of uh, United States in North America. Professor Sharon initiated an enthusiastic life path. She taught, she wrote, she organized workshops and postgraduate academic courses, and above all, a guidance inspired and motivated a community of intellectual followers all over the world. The seeding was fertile during this 15 years. It's a short journey, indeed. Narrative medicine is now a robust tree with branches spreading in many places, Canada, Europe, Middle East, South America, Australia, and so on. Portugal, thanks to Professor Isabel Fernandes, my good friend, Professor João Lobantunes, and many others, 
enthusiastically welcomed this new discipline, contributing to ground its intellectual and scientific basis. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Rita Sharon, remembering, if needed, her academic achievements at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons on her capacity as Professor of Clinical Medicine, the many awards she was the recipient of, the books she wrote, you remember Narrative Medicine Honoring the Story of Illness, the, the papers she extensively published, Journal of Medical Association, The Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, and so on. But above all, I would, I would also like to use this opportunity to pay tribute to Professor Sharon for a pioneer contribution to train healthcare professionals, making clinical care of sick persons more solidary, more ethical, more humanized. Bodies, stories, and selves. Our narrative saves life is the title of the Professor Sharon's keynote lecture of today. Rita, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much for, for having me. I'm, I'm sorry that English is, um, I, I don't speak any Portuguese at all, so you'll have to come with me in, in English. Um, on my way here on the airplane, uh, we saw the, the bridge, the, the new bridge, um, the April 25th bridge. Yes. And it was foggy, and we couldn't see it very well. Um, but I could see the beginning part with the, with the arches and the suspension. And then the long, long three miles almost into the river. And I was afraid as I sat in the plane looking at it that it didn't get to the other side. It, it, it disappeared it, 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 like into the river. And um, I was assured when the sun came out that indeed it does reach the other side. But that's a little bit how this field feels to me. That we all, and Isabel has been with us from the beginning, we all have launched something that feels like it responds to the needs of medicine, the needs of those of us who work in medicine and those who come to it. The reason I had to miss our, our, the March uh, um, um, conference is that I needed emergency surgery, emergency, and, and I'm so grateful to the surgeons who know how to fix things when they break. Hmm? So what I want to talk with you today about is one of, the, one of the things that doesn't feel quite completed in our journey. I think that one very, very important place that we all within narrative medicine, within humanistic medicine, have to really now understand is the continued gap um, that you heard of in the introduction, the gaps between the arts and the sciences, the gaps between very often the clinicians, the doctors, nurses, social workers who care for patients, and the patients themselves. Um, we know that as our medical science gets so very strong and powerful, by definition, it has to be reductive. It has to fragment. There is no way that the surgeon could fix my shoulder if he was worrying about anything else but my shoulder. That's all I wanted him to think about. And he did a marvelous job. But the reductiveness and the fragmentation leaves us always on the banks of a chasm. And the bridges that go between those banks are often not complete. And the I hope you know what I mean by chasm, a big gulf. That, that the doctor on this side can never, never reach the patient on this side because of 
all that divides them, mostly that one is sick and the other is well. Um, this is a this is a painting of Mont Saint Victoire by Paul Cezanne. He painted this mountain many, many times, maybe a hundred times. Can you see it? Is there too much light in here, or can you see it? Is it all right? Good. So he painted it, I think, about a hundred times, and. Every time, of course, he painted it, it was a different mountain. And he himself says, if I move my head to the right an inch, if I move my head to the left an inch, I see a different mountain. And so this just helps me uh, remember the uh, uh, chasms between perspectives. Uh, in the literary realm, think of Abraham and Isaac. Do, do we ever hear the story from Isaac's point of view? I don't think so. We barely hear it from Abraham's. Maybe we hear it from the Divine Father. I was thinking, and I'll tell you why. You'll figure out why in a minute. I was thinking about the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Do you know that story? Yeah. Um, do we hear it from the wolf's point of view? You know, there's a story to be heard there. He's following his nature. He's hungry. He has certain kinds of prey. Um, he's, he's got a perspective. Whereas we just hear about poor grandma and Little Red Riding Hood in his abdomen, right? After they've been eaten. Now, um, Within illness, the mountain darkens. Illness narratives are different from other kinds of stories because they force us to think about the end. And now I have to again ask for your forgiveness. You're going to think I've become very morbid. I haven't. The work lately has just brought me to um, focus on the place of mortality in the work we do. So don't be frightened, but that's where we're going for the next half hour or so. So th this, this Mont Saint Victoire is a little foreboding. We can see at the top a crater, which we didn't see on the earlier representation. We see this very um, rigid um, building it's got no windows on it. I'm not sure what it is, but it seems a threatening uh, introjection into that natural landscape. Um, the, the, uh, this, this looks to me much uh, more than the one before. It reminds me of the difference in prospects and the divide between the clinical prospect and the personal prospect the doctor's prospect and the patient's prospect, as if they're two different mountains. Um, now I'm going to give you my current favorite definition of health. Is that wonderful? Is that wonderful? Health is life lived in the silence of the organs. A French surgeon, René Leriche, uh, wrote this in 1936. It was Conguillem who brought it to our attention. Health is life lived in the silence of the organs. And so the patient is, is listening for the silence. And we, because this is the work we chose, we clinicians are listening for the noise. And so the fragmentation, the divides, the chasm, is the medical knowledge on the one side. Um, the personal knowledge on the other, not medical ignorance, but personal knowledge on the other. Uh, it's not only that one is well and one is sick. Um, it's rather that we, neither of us, has a very, has success in listening to what the other is listening to. In effect, they don't agree on what they're talking about. Now, many of us have been thinking for years and years, centuries, about the difference between illness and disease, 
the difference between the subjective and the objective representations or experiences of illness, um, um, the, uh, simply the difference between the biology and the meaning. But this is what we have to now really, uh, um, more than consider, really nail, because I think as long as these chasms exist between the clinical prospect and the personal prospect, we will not get to where we want to be, which is fully respectful, egalitarian, just, uh, uh, affirming care of the sick. So I'm going to give you an example of um, the different prospects of a patient and a clinician facing an illness and, in fact, caring for that illness. This first one is an operative note. It's a note of a liver transplantation. As you know, when patients have trouble with their liver, sometimes I'm going to go back because I don't want you reading it yet. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know that it's now almost a common, a common uh, um, procedure when someone is in liver failure that we take the failed liver out of the patient's abdomen and into that abdomen we plant um, a liver from either a live person, we can take half a liver from a live person and that person continues to live, or we take the liver from a dead man or a dead woman and place it into the abdomen of the patient. So this is what's going on in this, in this operation, and this is how the surgeon uh, um, dictates the, the, uh, uh, the procedure. The right lobe was mobilized, the inferior vena cava was identified, and the right adrenal vein was divided between silk ligatures and was reinforced with a metallic clip. There was no evidence of extrahepatic tumor. The infrahepatic, the infrahepatic vena cava clamp was placed. The portal venous clamp was placed. And a Satinsky clamp was placed. Blunt hepatectomy was performed with curved Mayo scissors. The hepatic vein orifices were opened, and the cadaveric allograft was brought up onto the field. The suprahepatic anastomosis was performed with a running 3-0 proline. The infrahepatic anastomosis was performed with a running 4-0 proline. The portal vein anastomosis was performed with a running 6-0 proline. Reperfusion was achieved, and the liver demonstrated fair function. The patient tolerated reperfusion well. So I used this slide when I gave grand rounds some time ago, not too long ago, at an American uh, medical school. Uh, and it was the grand rounds for surgery. So the first thing that was said about, about these two slides was from the chair of surgery. And he says, they did a blunt hepatectomy with scissors? And then we talked a little bit. And, and this was with the faculty and the residents and the students in surgery. So we talked a little more about this description and I asked the audience, what happens if the patient tolerated reperfusion poorly? And then the blustery, um, some said um, brutal, associate chair of, of surgery says, when the patient tolerates reperfusion poorly, you take the clamps off. And at first, the, the circulation through the liver looks all right. You're getting a good Doppler. That means the, the, the pulse is, is healthy going through the liver. And then in a few minutes, you see that the, the uh, Doppler slows down. The amplitude of the uh, artery decreases. Then you look at the EKG, and the QRS is widening out. That's a sign that the patient's heart is acutely injured. The QRS is widening out, and pretty soon you're pumping on the guy's chest, which means the patient has died on the table, and you do your best to resuscitate him. Now, this was from a surgeon who does this operation many, many times. 
his associates and his uh, students had never heard him talk like this. That they said, this is Dr. Andrews? The point is that it took very little to get the surgeon to dwell on the death that stalks his operating room. And you can imagine, uh, there may be surgeons in the audience, but you can imagine the um, flagrancy of that moment when something that you've talked a patient into doing, that you've given your, your word, uh, will, will go well, um, and you lose the patient on the table. So this was a very powerful lesson for me, certainly for the associates of Dr. Andrews, that's not his real name, um, that, that the, the uh, specter of mortality is always there, very, very close to the reductive, fragmented, technical, procedural aspects of this kind of medicine. Now this is close to the same mountain we saw before, but uh, I hope you agree with me that it's gentler, it's lighter. And I want to read with you now a uh, um, writing from Richard McCann, an American poet. He's the director of creative writing in the American University in Washington, who had hepatitis C, had liver failure, and himself underwent a liver transplant. This is after he had successfully gone through the transplant. At night in bed, I often thought of the person who had died. When I was quiet, I could feel myself quietly grieving for him, just as I was grieving for my own body, so deeply wounded and cut apart, though still alive. I'm sorry, I wanted to tell him. Sometimes I woke in the middle of the night, troubled to realize that I had taken a piece of him inside me as if I had eaten him to stay alive. Other nights, I thought of the donor with great tenderness, sometimes perceiving him as male, sometimes as female. These nights, I placed my hand over what seemed to be still her liver, not mine, and slowly massaged the right side of my body, a broken reliquary with a bit of flesh inside. It's OK. It's OK, I whispered over and over as if I were attempting to quiet a troubled spirit, not my own. Now, what, what, do, you, what, what do you see, what do you notice in, in, those, in those passages? What, 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 are the, what, what are the images that stand out for you as you read this? Anything? Just holler out. What, what word did you notice in, the, in all of this? Mm. And what is a reliquary? Hmm? Somebody, what's a reliquary? Yes. And, and, and usually a part of the, it's like dead, the parts of dead people, right? Are like, like saints uh, who we, who we uh, pray to little bits of their bone, little bits of their hair, little bits of their flesh, become, as you say, sacred. And the reliquary itself is, is usually a beautiful gold ornamented. So to think that Richard McCann now considers his body to be a container for something far more sacred than he, right? To which the rest of us can kind of pray. Um, it's just such a stunning, stunning image of how this particular patient made sense of what he had been through. It was, it was only in reviewing this slide that I realized that's why I picked Little Red Riding Hood, right? He felt as if he had eaten the other, the other person just to stay alive. So, so the dichotomy between Dr. Andrew's description of the operation 
and the recipient's description of the operation gives us a sense of the magnitude of this dichotomy. I think it's a very complex dichotomy. It's not that the doctors care about the body and the patient cares about the soul. It's not that. But it begins there. It begins dichotomized as if, you know, Dr. Andrews operates on the abdomen just hoping there's enough light in the operating room and that he has enough of the equipment that he needs and that people know what they're doing and that Richard McCann experiences this tremendous religious symbolic affective ritual. It might seem that way at the time of the operation, but I think, and this is the part that narrative medicine can really begin to clarify, in part through literary study of, of um, the, the writings of patients and the medical study of how we actually go about doing our work, um, I, I, I think that each of them within themselves also has this experience of doubling. So McCann is writing his poetry even while he undergoes rejections of this liver. He knows that without the liver, he would be dead. He would not be able to continue his poetry. That Dr. Andrews realizes himself in between procedures that he too is an object, a body, and he too will succumb to some life-ending disease or trauma. Um, and, and of course, that's, I mean, doctors have a very hard time when they get sick, they can't admit it. When they get sick, their colleagues don't know what to do with them. We're not supposed to get sick. Uh, it makes life difficult when doctors get sick. And that's because it kind of punctures this assumption that that we don't share the, obje the, the status as object that our patients do. At the same time, and I think this is the promise of this work, both the patient and the doctor realize the integrity of their body-soul, if you will. Do you see? That, that, that McCann knows that he uses his body to write his poetry, and that this use to which he puts his body opens him up to his existence as a symbol-using, language-using individual. He knows that in his life as a receiver of music, as a dancer, uh, in his sexual acts, he knows that, that his body helps to resonate between just being the physical apparatus that subtends the, the, the life and the meaning-making and idea-generating self. And I think uh, we may have to work a little bit harder, um, but we know that Dr. Andrews and those uh, uh, like him, in the middle of doing this liver transplant, he sees his hands in a stranger's abdomen bluntly dissecting out a damaged, noisy organ and replacing it with the organ of a person now dead. He cannot not know that this is what he does. And every now and then, and it was very dramatic uh, when, when he spoke in my rounds, um, every now and then flares up an awareness of what his body does. I think... Uh, I, 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 I can only guess uh, that he's both mortified and glorified by the exposure to himself of what he does because of what he risks, what others risk for him or with him. Uh, I think that to all of us, not just the surgeons, to any nurse, doctor, social worker, physical therapist, any of us who treat bodily illnesses uh, were aware because of the pain we inevitably cause, because of the mistakes we inevitably make, we are aware of both the savagery of our actions and what amounts sometimes to their magical powers. 
And these are at least intermittently available to all of us. So here, here's what we would like for both the Dr. Andrews's of the world and the Richard McCann's of the world. We, uh, we would hope, we would aspire that they would both be able to understand the relation between, if you will, the body and the soul in the way that Merleau-Ponty describes The bond between the soul and the body is not a parallelism. It is to be understood as the bond between the convex and the concave, between the solid vault and the hollow it forms. The soul is the hollow of the body. The body is the distension of the soul. You can see how the phenomenology, especially the phenomenology of the body, has so um, invaginated into our studies of narrative medicine, right along with the literary studies uh, and the literature itself, uh, the the work of Miller Ponty and those uh, uh, those who work with him really give us concepts and and language, deeply poetic language, with which to. Um, hope to articulate these relations. The soul is the hollow of the body and the body is the distension of the soul. So where they, where they are Dr. Andrews's and our Richard McCann's and all of us, where we can unite is indeed in mortality. I don't mean just in death. I mean simply in the state of being mortal if you will, yes, can I get away with that? The state of being mortal, that we do our best to forget, and as I just said and kind of made a point of, those in healthcare do especially their best to forget. And we, 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 we mislead ourselves. We say, you know, the, 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 the fantasy especially for those starting out, is, well, I'm around all this sickness and dying all the time. I'm so close to it. I'm sure by now I'm immune. So we convince ourselves that we're different from the patients and we're not going to die. We convince ourselves that that happens on that planet, but not on our planet. It's just a very mm, common way of being able to get the work done. But where we can complete that bridge, where we can really uh, heal the chasm between the ones who care for illness and the ones who are themselves ill, uh, is in a frank and joyous, acknowledgement and acceptance of this condition of being mortal. There's no choice about it. Those of us who are clinicians face mortality because we're responsible for forestalling it in others, where those who are patients face mortality because it's happening to them. Um, it's a novelist who says better than anyone I have found what it really means to be mortal. This is Irish novelist John Banville, Dublinist, um, overhearing Zeus talking from Mount Olympus about the fact that he envies humans their mortality. Listen, this is the mortal world. It is a world where nothing is lost, where all is accounted for while yet the mystery of things is preserved. A world where they may live, however briefly, however tenuously, in the failing evenings of the self, solitary and at the same time together, somehow here in this place, dying as they may be, and yet fixed forever in a luminous, unending instant.
So this right now, as we stand in this stand or sit, in this gorgeous auditorium uh, on the banks of this noble river, uh, are together in a luminous, unending instant. Hmm? And, and the only way we can be in this luminous, unending instant is to be, however tenuously, however briefly, in the failing evenings of the self. That's, that's the condition. Um, and we can certainly be equal to and even um, um, a part of that condition. We know it all the time. I watched the moon set the other night. Um, it was full on October 27, and I could see the moon uh, um, setting from my west-facing window. It took, f it, I, I watched it for all 50 minutes as it slowly sank under the, into the horizon of Manhattan. And I know, watching the moon set, that I am an object on a massive planet, Earth, and the moon, 239,000 miles away, is another massive object. And I know that my object, Earth, is simply revolving east so that I no longer see that other massive object. So that I feel the excitement and the location of being, in fact, an object on an object, looking at another object. That this is part of this is part of life um, um, incarnate. Life incarnate. Yes. And we also know how the moon has inspired us, ritually, religiously, symbolically, uh, artistically, uh, so that all of us have cathected some of the moon's symbolism into our daily lives, into ways in which we make meaning. And I spent 50 minutes watching it set, not because it's a massive object 239,000 miles away, but because it has meaning. And so that's just a common example, another luminous unending instant in which for slices of time we achieve this, this unity that Meruaponti speaks of, of the concave and the convex. And this is the same mountain now, now seeming stripped down maybe to some of its um, essentials. Hmm? But it's, I hope, I mean, I, I hope these different things that I've told you about uh, are bringing you along with me to be thinking about what now can we do within healthcare um, to help us all achieve this unity not just to limit the distance between the one who's sick and the one who's caring for the sick, but even for each one of us within ourselves to reduce those dichotomies and to appreciate the doubling, the concavity convexity of being objects that inevitably, you know, break and have to get fixed and eventually end and at the same time, the, the profound, symbolic, ritualistic, uh, religious, um, relational, affective, meaningfulness, to the point that I can propose that healthcare, perhaps better than any other locations in life, is a door to the integrated life for everybody, for everybody. Every time someone comes to a doctor, even if it's to get a flu shot, it is on the background of the mortality. However briefly, however tenuously, in the failing evenings of the self. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to come. So everything we do in healthcare is on the background of the failing evenings of the self. 
And I think, and those of us in narrative medicine think, that we, we have a contribution here because we can see that through our work in, in literature and phenomenology and sources of meaning uh, with the ethicists and the philosophers who think about these things with us. And, and I think that, that we can really take advantage um, for ourselves and for those who we take care of. Um, we can take advantage of the nearness of that condition and the fact that it becomes visible. I think it's here and nowhere else that these two prospects come into contact. The prospect of being an object and the prospect of being a person with meaning. When the object, when the body, when the, when the object of the body is at issue, when it's threatened with ill health, it becomes visible. Health is life lived in the silence of the organs. So there's plenty of times that we're very aware of our bodies when we make music, when we dance, when we make love, when we walk, when we climb mountains, when we have children, uh, when, when the body is an instrument of, of life. And in illness and dying, the body is an instrument of, of death. So it's in the realm of healthcare with the noisy organs w when the body is threatened that we simply have the opportunity to see this condition, to see the mortal condition, and then perhaps to, to overcome the dichotomous, fearful uh, response that we so often have. So, so the point of bringing you through this somewhat dark description of illness and, and healthcare is to suggest that these are, there are ways that we can deepen the meaning of living for, for those who care for the sick and those who are sick themselves or who come to see us so that they don't get sick I mean, this really excludes no one. What we know is that sickness requires witnesses. When, when, when persons are threatened with illness, uh, why do they come see doctors, nurses, social workers? They come so as to be witnessed. They come so as to show themselves. What is wrong with me? Look at me. What is wrong with me? Um, Adriana Cavarero, a phenomenologist, a student of Merleau-Ponty. The expositive and relational character of identity are thus indistinguishable. One, this is the important sentence, one always appears to someone. One cannot appear to be recognized if there is no one else there. Existing consists in disclosing oneself. The language of the existent assumes the body condition of this and not another. What, what Cavarero is trying to say here is that as we try to see who we are and in illness how we are, we have to bring ourselves to be seen by someone else. There needs to be another to whom we expose ourselves. This is what can happen in healthcare, that the meeting between doctor and patient, nurse and patient, become an authentic uh, event of, of witnessing, that one see the other for who the other is. It often doesn't happen, and that's why the fragmenting and the reduction uh, hampers the work that could go on. I'm going to show you a series of paintings uh, by Ferdinand Hodler, a Swiss painter, a portraitist, a landscape uh, painter. Uh, he painted them of his lover, Valentin Godet-Darel, 
She is the mother of his child. Uh, soon after she gave birth to this daughter, she developed ovarian cancer. And this was in the 19 teens, 1914, 1916. Um, and she died very quickly and painfully, uh, a, young, a young woman. Uh, Hodler was with her through the ordeal. Um, and because he was a painter, he witnessed her and her ordeal and his loss um, in, in paintings. I will show you several. The youth. The illness. The exhaustion. The pain. The agony. The last painting. By now she has died. And the sunset over Lake Geneva which was painted in the series with these others. So Hodler was able to um, face and represent and witness um, her illness and, and her death. Uh, and he gave to us um, the evidence of his witnessing Um, we are not we are not all great artists, um, but I think we have within us the capacity to witness that which another goes through. Um, and I'm going to tell you just a little bit. My time is running short. I'm going to tell you a little bit of something that one of my patients taught me about about how we can together see one another as an illness proceeds. Um, this is a woman I knew very well. Um, I'd been her doctor for 30 years, and she was essentially healthy. Um, she had had a rheumatic fever as a child, and her mother always told her that she was sick, and no, she couldn't climb trees, and no, she couldn't run, and no, she couldn't be on the baseball team. Um, but she was, she was healthy as an adult. And then uh, on a weekend, she developed a fever. She felt like she had the flu. And so she went to one of these local like emergency room places in the city just to get some you know, remedy for the flu, if that's what it was. Well, they gave her that. But then they also said, oh, by the way, uh, you're diabetic. Your sugar is high. So you have to take these pills, and you have to check your blood twice a day for the sugar, and you have to go see your doctor as soon as you can. Um, she was abs this was absolutely intolerable to her. She came into me the next Monday. It was absolutely intolerable to her. I couldn't exactly figure out what was intolerable. But we, you know, we spent some time talking. I examined her. We made some decisions about what to do with the, with the uh, high glucose. Um, but then the next day, I found myself writing about it because it was very confusing to me, and I didn't understand why she was so unalterably undone by this news. So I, I just started writing in order to know what had happened because I know enough by now that if I don't represent something, I don't see it. This has become one of our principles. So I wrote, it was a page and a half. I wrote what I thought had happened. I mailed it to her at her home uh, because I wanted to know what was it from her side. This is what I remember. And I thought, uh, seeing my uh, version, 
might help her to, to think about her own. And um, I'll just read you a couple of the paragraphs of, of what I had sent to her. Um, this, was, this was in the middle of winter. Two middle-aged women sit in a cramped clinic office in Upper Manhattan. They have known one another for decades, one of them moving through a series of health reversals and accomplishments, and the other, as her doctor, accompanying her through them. The patient has been healthy, a history of rheumatic fever, osteoarthritis, a total knee replacement. A stalwart Upper West Sider, that's a neighborhood in Manhattan, an activist and progressive, a wife and mother, a university professor, a force of nature. The patient bicycles the river, eats sensibly, helps the planet be as safe as it can be. The women had both been part of a movement to stop the Vietnam War. They had taken to the streets with our bodies ourselves. They staked their own lives and careers on ideals of fairness and freedom. Neither of them had become rich or famous, yet both felt somehow they had been dutiful to their commitments to the good and the right. Um, when she hears about this diabetes from the, from, the, from the emergency room, she feels some iron door on her health slamming shut. Diabetics get heart attacks, strokes, lose limbs, go blind, need dialysis. Had she not been taking care of herself? Had she not done enough to take care of herself? Was it so grave to have a bagel with some cream cheese now and then? She savaged herself, flagellating herself for impulses given into, pleasures happily indulged in. She must have had a death wish all this time. And all this time, she thought she was doing OK. How could she have done this to herself? She had been fooling herself. She was indulging in a stupid fantasy of health while within her cells, damage was already underway. And then I tried to describe what we did together on the background, on the, on the, on the foreground of, of this presentation. They sit at the desk staring at one another, saying little, taking one another in. Slowly, the doctor wonders aloud about what this epiphany signifies. They ease from talk about blood sugar to talk about love and meaning. They wonder, together, how growing old can happen with clarity and truth. Must we lie to ourselves in order to endure? Can we accept our limited time on Earth and still enjoy it? Not technical, but personal. Their conversation deepens the contact between them, so they both are discovering why they do what they do, what the deep strata of desire and meaning might be. They come together to expose the ground floor of self, its realizations of the limits of a life, and maybe at the depth of that darkness, a gratitude and awe that life has been given to begin with. So that was the conversation we had in the face of her terror at this new threatening um, illness. Um, as I was writing it on the plane, I hadn't decided to write it in the third person. But when I read it, I realized why it came out that way, which was really to put us equidistant from the speaker. Um, and had I used the I, that wouldn't have happened. I just realized that afterwards so that it really was the story itself choosing its genre. And only after writing that was I aware of the fact that this encounter exposed me to the condition of mortality, as well as it did her. That I, too, as she did, underwent a face-off with my not-too-distant death. So as we sat together at my desk, 
we looked at one another in recognition, a reciprocal recognition in which we became mirrors for one another at the same time that we were doctor and patient. Now it helped that we had, we, there were similarities in our lives, but that I think was not necessary. So that it was, it was as if by accepting consciously that I share with patients the status of living toward death, that we together somehow see in the inevitability of death the wordless worth of the life to come. I think that's possible to do almost every time you see a patient. Here is what she wrote. She came in for the next visit um, holding my, my letter saying, every time I read this, I cry. At the end of that visit, uh, I wrote what I had to write. You know, we, now we use computers and I type everything into this medical uh, electronic record. Uh, so I finished my typing and then I just turned the machine around to her so she could read what I had written. And then I said, you know, I gave her the keyboard and said, please finish the note. You know, what happens next? And this is what she wrote. Um, when she showed it to me, she says, the, what she said to me before I read it was, um, she says, you might have to change the pronouns because I started with she and I ended with I. And, and in, in fact, she does. Uh, feels empowered to make choices which have contributed to weight loss and a general feeling of who is in charge here. This is what she typed. Um, and then some things about uh, the need to do more exercise. But then she goes, thinking of myself as an old person is not as good as thinking of myself as a person who is old. My students think I'm great. My coworkers appreciate the role I play in my students' lives. This is my greatest sense of satisfaction. It allows me to appreciate the years of experience which lend themselves to my teaching. And then the final sentence, my mother's voice does not have to be silenced, but certainly toned down to a low murmur. So, I mean, that's just one example of ways in which this fix we're in, as humans, can be shared. Uh, it turned out she did not have diabetes. Uh, I explained to her when you have the flu, a lot of the time the sugar will go up, but it'll come down. So, you know, we watched it, and by now her sugar's fine, she's not on medicine, she doesn't check it every day, she eats differently. She does do more exercise. Um, but, but just doing this simple thing, this narrative medicine with her, gave her another way to look at what had really paralyzed her. And then finally, uh, this, uh, what I'm leafing through here is a chapter in our, up, in our forthcoming book. My, my group and I are writing um, um, the most, you know, the, uh, the volume on where the principles and practices of narrative medicine stand right now. And we're calling it Principles and Practice of Narrative Medicine. Uh, it should be out in about six months. But, so I, I wrote her into this, into this um, chapter and had her read it before I went ahead and, and published it. And she says, kind of with her hand on the chapter, she says, Reading this made me understand myself better than I ever did. So as more and more things like that happen in our practice of narrative medicine, we're more and more, I'm not going to say confident, but wondering whether this fresh approach to the care of the sick might have dividends even beyond what we can see now. Uh, that it might make us more attentive to what patients say. It might make us more reflective about what we ourselves undergo in these lives lived around sick and dying people. But I think like this uh, uh, demonstrates to me that it can have these startling uh, other <laughs> um, outcomes of, in this case, a shared and conjoined experience of, of 
you know, briefly, tenuously, being in the failing evenings of the self, and yet, somehow, somehow, here in this place, dying as they may be, uh, faced with these luminous, unending instants. I think through the vagaries of illness, which, God help us, happens to all of us, come these dazzling dividends to all involved. Not just knowing who the self is, but knowing on this massive object called Earth, what goes on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rita. I think it, this was an epiphanic moment. So many lessons to take home. So many inspiring messages. Thank you. Uh, don't leave the stage, please, because I think we have questions or comments. Yes, please. Here's, here's the final Mont Saint-Victoire. Thank you very much. Uh, there you are. My, my question is from a clinician also. And I, I believe that one of the reasons to, to, to go to the next position was to be able to treat patients, indeed. And then I found that uh, uh, there is a, a great violence in medicine, not just in surgery and whatever, liver transplantation. How do you balance this dichotomy? What do, what do you feel every day? So the question is how we can balance the dichotomy which we feel every day. Um, this is how I do it, by, by really representing what goes on. When you write something, or Hodler, so Hodler is a painter, so he painted it. I'm a writer, so I write it. Some of my colleagues are, are sculptors or musicians, so they use, but in one way or another, um, it is the representing of the reality that we have to do. Uh, the reason that healthcare workers are so upset with these electronic health records, I don't know if it's this way here, is that it doesn't let us represent anymore. You have to, you have to click on check boxes and, and things like that. We need to be able to represent that which we see in order to see it. So m my answer to how to, how to uh, 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 transcend the dichotomy is to make art of it, to make it become um, something with form. Once, once we confer form on an experience, an event, a situation, only then with form, whether in words or something else, is it legible? Is it visible? Nelson Goodman, philosopher of art, says when we look at an object, we see a version or construal of it. Cezanne and his mountain. When, when we see an object, we see a version or construal. But then Goodman says, when we represent that version or construal, and I think this is why Cezanne painted, when we represent that version or construal, we do not copy it, we achieve it. Ta-da. Other questions? Rita, a critical question in, in, in clinical practice is the question of the hope. When fear comes, uh, 
can you elaborate a little bit on how narrative medicine can better equip yes. doctors and nurses yes. to transmit mm. this, 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 this theme, this topic of yes. hope to the patient? Yes. Um, it's, 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 it's very vexed, isn't it? That, that we feel that we can't fully say what we see, say what we know, because it might cause despair. And so we always want to keep alive some hope that, and it's usually not articulated, hope for what? It doesn't usually get articulated beyond keep some hope alive. Diane Meyer, who is the, uh, one of the leading figures in the US of palliative care, tells a story of caring for a young woman. I knew this patient, too. Um, woman in her late 40s with uh, end-stage lung cancer, not a smoker, and she was dying. And she had been through all the aggressive chemotherapies, all the radia radiation, all the surgeries. Um, she had a very trusted oncologist at Memorial who, she, uh, who, she, who had seen her through the whole illness. And in the very, very end stages of her life, he recommended that she have another very aggressive experimental uh, chemotherapy. And she knew what that would mean in terms of additional suffering and he was not at all guaranteeing that it would add much to her life, but he recommended that, that she try, back to Bethesda, back to NIH, another aggressive chemotherapy. The patient tells this to uh, the palliative care doctor, Diane Meyer. Diane says, why does he want you to do that? He, why? So Diane calls the oncologist, says, Dick, why, are you, why do you think Judith should do this other chemotherapy? And what the oncologist says answers your question. He said, otherwise, she would think I was abandoning her. So that was his version of hope. And I believe that's quite widespread. And Diane had to gently tell this oncologist that Judy doesn't need you to send her back to Bethesda for more chemotherapy. Judy needs for you to be with her, to be there as a witness, to be there as now she's dying. So, so the hope, I believe, is from being there, from not turning away, how many times does the doctor say, there's nothing more I can do for you? It happens all the time. And so the hope, what's the patient hoping for? This patient was not hoping for health. She knew she was in the very last days of her life. And what she had from her lover was the unvarnished, uninterrupted, uh, unfrightened witness who accompanied her. And I believe that's what patients hope. I mean, John Donne said it in the 16th century, illness is the greatest misery, and of illness the greatest misery is solitude. So I think the hope resides in the hope of our presence and our continued being with. Uh, thank you, my name is Olivia Bina. I'm at the Institute of Social Sciences here in Lisbon. Uh, thank you for the wonderful and inspiring presentation. I just had one question. I'm by no means an expert in anything you have talked about, so consider myself as a, just a participant in, in the observations that you discuss. You talk about, you mention the soul, the body, <coughs> the self, and death. And my question to you is, 
to what extent do you feel that these are four notions that I would say, as the average woman in the street, are very rarely discussed, conceptualized, thought of in an average lifetime. So to what extent do you feel that this is changing, both from the perspective of your side of the equation, so as doctors, and of the patients that are coming to you, um, at least in the Western society, none of this is really normal discussion. But maybe I'm, I'm wrong. I think, what a swell question. I, th I think the answer is bifurcated. That on the one hand, um, there's an awful lot more today than there was 10, 20 years ago attention to things like contemplative lives, Zen, yoga, meditation, uh, um, uh, all these restorative spas to which you go for some healing. And, and um, in, in part because mainstream healthcare and medicine have gotten so technical, there's a surge of integrative, complementary, other forms of healing from acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, massage therapy, many, many ways in which ordinary people are looking for wellness. So on the one hand, that's a way to say, oh no, there is more and more attention to the body and the soul and how they get along. The bifurcated answer is maybe things have gotten so bad um, with the multitasking and the uh, 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 relationships we have these days, not with lovers but with devices, um, that, <laughs> that it may be that, that your, the nihilistic side of your question may be, may be the case, that we as a civilization are losing, losing the connection to um, our tenuous, brief, failing evenings. Uh, I happen to think the first one is true. I, I, I think that, um, and I mean, there, I mean you're, the, the answer requires a textbook. Uh, but, but if you think of sources that, that persons used to go to for nourishment in these spheres, they went to church. They had organized religion. Um, well, that helped it a little bit, but it made it very rigid, didn't it? So that now that there's much more openness, in well, in some parts of the world anyway, some parts are getting even more rigid, of course, um, but, but there is more leeway uh, for persons to seek meaning where they may find it. And it may not be in Judeo-Christian doctrine, and it may not be in Orthodox Jewish uh, practices. Um, it still, it, well, it continues to be in Orthodox practices a lot of the places. But I think there's more leeway, um, and I think it's almost become a commonplace uh, for persons to, uh, you know, seek their meaning. Um, I, I'm a cynical optimist. Hello, Rita. Here? Yeah, where? Yeah. Thank you for your conference. Uh, I'm Joana Rouso from the Institute of Bioethics of Portuguese Catholic University. We also have a project in, project in narrative medicine. It starts uh, now. And my doubt is uh, what can we do when, when we, we don't have time? From, to do things like you do, like represent uh, the, the situation. There's two answers to that. Again, it's not bifurcated. There's two, there's two simultaneous answers to that. Um, one is that the time available, you're talking about in regular health care. One answer is that the time available to do the health care is, is shrinking. And uh, it is the case in the U.S. that you get 12 or 15 minutes to, to meet with a patient. Uh, in, in the U.K., it's even worse in the National Health Service. 
um, in Taiwan, uh, they see 100 patients a day. Each patient gets a minute or two. So one can argue that uh, when time is so restricted, uh, one has to get really, really good at um, uh, uh, hearing what the patient is saying. You have to get really sophisticated in paying attention. Uh, and if it helps you to write things down, that's great. It's toward understanding as accurately as you can what this patient is telling you, is going through, um, what the other colleagues are telling you about, uh, you know, the possible uh, 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 treatment options. So that's the first answer. But more and more, I think the second answer becomes truer. And the second answer is this. So you're only given 15 minutes to see each patient. Says who? And I think that uh, worldwide, the, the situation of healthcare, the, the execution of healthcare, has, has surrendered to other um, goals. At Columbia, they instituted a new feature on the electronic medical record so that now, in addition to writing the history and the physical and the lab tests and the medicines, there's another button that you have to click on the computer screen, and it instructs you to list each of the medical conditions with their full ICDX, that's the diagnostic criteria, number, which takes quite a while to actually find and import into the record. The, this is appalling, and I'm blushing as I tell you what the name of this button is and the sign, the icon of the button. Are you ready? It's called the super bill. And the icon is a dollar sign. So we are flagrantly admitting that we are organizing our healthcare so as to increase its revenue. And of course, the more of these ICDX codes that you list, the more the hospital can bill. So that's where we are. And to say says who means that there is a growing dichotomy between those who deliver the healthcare and those who oversee the delivery of the healthcare, and that interests of um, uh, revenue have come to predominate. And in the, in the States, it, it looks like it won't be too long before nurses, doctors, physical therapists just stand up and say, we're not gonna do this anymore. We're, we're not, we can't do this anymore. As it is, they're staying in their offices till 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night, just finishing all of these lists. So how does, that, how does that answer fit with your experience? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just, uh, it's my answer. Uh, yeah. Every day when I work on this project, uh, what can we do to yes. solve this problem? But I, I think it's at, it's at that level yes. of significance. It's not just fiddling around, oh, can't you give me 18 minutes? It's not yes. that. It's at this level of, of really recognizing what are the forces here involved. Thank you. From the organizers that we have to stop the papel do moderador é também ser antipático. But before leaving, I'd like to invite people to share uh, to share an applause to Professor Sharon oh. by this, I quote, luminous and symbolically unending instant. But you have to Como talvez saibam, o programa tinha duas partes, ou tem duas partes. A primeira era a palestra da professora Sharon, a segunda é o lançamento 
de um livro que foi realizado maioritariamente por pessoas do nosso projeto, mas não exclusivamente, também por alguns convidados que fomos uh, tendo ao longo de, de alguns dos anos em que o projeto se tem desenvolvido e, portanto, uh, admito que nem toda a gente possa querer continuar, portanto, se tiverem outros compromissos e não puderem continuar, uh, têm a liberdade, naturalmente, de sair, mas se quiserem ficar connosco mais um pouco e assistir ao lançamento do nosso livro, temos o maior gosto em que continuem na sala. Mas, portanto, agora é uma segunda parte do programa que estava previsto começar justamente às seis e meia. Estamos de uma pontualidade britânica e eu congratulo-me com isso. Em todo caso, vou ter que abrir a porta para o caso de haver pessoas no exterior que não tenham podido vir à primeira parte e que queiram estar connosco nesta segunda parte. Por isso, agora é essa segunda parte a que iremos dar início em dois minutos, talvez. Muito obrigada a todos por terem estado connosco. Muito obrigada à nossa palestrante. Thank you so much, Rita. Thank you.